Noah Webster, Jr., was an American lexicographer, textbook pioneer, English-language speaking reformer, political writer, editor, and prolific author. He has been called the father of American scholarship and education. His blue-backed speller books taught five generations of American children how to spell and read, secularizing their education. According to Ellis, he gave Americans a secular catechism to the nation, state. Webster's name has become synonymous with dictionary in the United States especially the modern Merriam-Webster Dictionary that was first published in 1828 as an American Dictionary of the English Language. He was one of the founding fathers of the United States. Biography Webster was born in the Western Division of Hartford, to an established family. His father, Noah Sr. His father was primarily a farmer, though he was also deacon of the local congregational church, captain of the town's militia, and a founder of a local book society. After American independence, he was appointed a justice of the peace. Webster's father never attended college, but he was intellectually curious and prized education. Webster's mother spent long hours teaching her children spelling, mathematics and music. At age six, Webster began attending a dilapidated one-room primary school built by West Hartford's Ecclesiastical Society. Years later, he described the teachers as the dregs of humanity, and complained that the instruction was mainly in religion. Webster's experiences there motivated him to improve the educational experience of future generations. At age 14, his church pastor began tutoring him in Latin and Greek to prepare him for entering Yale College. Webster enrolled at Yale just before his 16th birthday, studying during his senior year with Ezra Stiles, Yale's president. His four years at Yale overlapped the American Revolutionary War, and because of food shortages and threatened British invasions, many of his classes had to be held in other towns. Webster did serve in the Connecticut militia. His father had mortgaged the farm to send Webster to Yale, but he was now on his own and had nothing more to do with his family. Webster lacked career plans after graduating from Yale in 1778, later writing that a liberal arts education disqualifies a man for business. He taught school briefly in Glastonbury but the working conditions were harsh and the pay low. He quit to study law. While studying law under future U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth, Webster also taught full-time in Hartford, which was grueling and ultimately impossible to continue. Quitting his legal studies for a year and lapsing into a depression, he found another practicing attorney to tutor him and completed his studies and passed the bar examination in 1781. As the Revolutionary War was still going on, he could not find work as a lawyer. He received a master's degree from Yale by giving an oral dissertation to the Yale graduating class. Later that year, he opened a small private school in western Connecticut that was a success. Nevertheless, he soon closed it and left town, probably because of a failed romance. Turning to literary work as a way to overcome his losses and channel his ambitions, he began writing a series of well-received articles for a prominent New England newspaper justifying and praising the American Revolution and arguing that the separation from Britain was permanent. He then founded a private school catering to wealthy parents in Goshen, New York, and by 1785, he had written his speller, a grammar book and a reader for elementary schools. Proceeds from continuing sales of the popular blue-backed speller enabled Webster to spend many years working on his famous dictionary. Webster was by nature a revolutionary, seeking American independence from the cultural thraldom to Britain. To replace it he sought to create a utopian America, cleansed of luxury and ostentation and the champion of freedom. By 1781, Webster had an expansive view of the new nation. American nationalism was superior to Europe because American values were superior, he claimed. America sees the absurdities, she sees the kingdoms of Europe, disturbed by wrangling sectaries, or their commerce. 
population and improvements of every kind cramped and retarded, because the human mind like the body is fetid, and bound fast by the cords of policy and superstition. She laughs at their folly and shuns their errors. She founds her empire upon the idea of universal toleration. She admits all religions into her bosom. She secures the sacred rights of every individual, and she sees a thousand discordant opinions live in the strictest harmony. It will finally raise her to a pitch of greatness and luster, before which the glory of ancient Greece and Rome shall dwindle to a point, and the splendor of modern empires fade into obscurity. Webster dedicated his speller and dictionary to providing an intellectual foundation for American nationalism. From 1787 to 1789 Webster was an outspoken supporter of the new constitution. In October 1787, he wrote a pamphlet titled An Examination into the Leading Principles of the Federal Constitution proposed by the late convention held at Philadelphia, published under the pen name A Citizen of America, the pamphlet was influential, particularly outside New York State. In terms of political theory, he de-emphasized virtue and emphasized widespread ownership of property. He was one of the few Americans who paid much attention to the French theorist Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It was not Rousseau's politics but his ideas on pedagogy and Emile that influenced Webster in adjusting his speller to the stages of a child's development. Federalist editor, Webster married well and had joined the elite in Hartford but did not have much money. In 1793, Alexander Hamilton lent him $1,500 to move to New York City to edit the leading Federalist Party newspaper. In December, he founded New York's first daily newspaper, American Minerva, which he edited it for four years, writing the equivalent of 20 volumes of articles and editorials. He also published the semi-weekly publication, The Herald, a gazette for the country. As a Federalist spokesman, he was repeatedly denounced by the Jeffersonian Republicans as a pusillanimous, half-begotten, self-dubbed patriot, an incurable lunatic, and a deceitful newsmonger, pedagogue and quack. Rival Federalist pamphleteer Peter Porcupine said Webster's pro-French views made him a traitor to the cause of federalism, calling him a toad in the service of sans culottism, a prostitute wretch, a great fool, and a bare-faced liar, a spiteful viper, and a maniacal pedant. Webster, the consummate master of words, was distressed. Even the use of words like the people, democracy, and equality in public debate bothered him. For such words were metaphysical abstractions that either have no meaning or at least none that mere mortals can comprehend. Webster followed French radical thought and urged a neutral foreign policy when France and Britain went to war in 1793. But when French minister citizen Jenet set up a network of pro-Jacobin democratic republican societies that entered American politics and attacked President Washington, Webster condemned him. He called on fellow Federalist editors to all agree to let the clubs alone, publish nothing for or against them. They are a plant of exotic and forced birth. The sunshine of peace will destroy them. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1799. For decades, he was one of the most prolific authors in the new nation, publishing textbooks, political essays, a report on infectious diseases and newspaper articles for his Federalist Party. He wrote so much that a modern bibliography of his published works required 655 pages. He moved back to New Haven in 1798. He was elected as a Federalist to the Connecticut House of Representatives in 1800-1802-1807. Copyright Politician Daniel Webster was Noah Webster's distant relative, he sponsored Noah's proposed copyright bill, the first major statutory revision of U.S. copyright law. The 1831 Act was a result of intensive lobbying by Noah Webster and his agents in Congress. Webster also played a critical role lobbying individual states throughout the country during the 1780s to pass the first American copyright laws. 
which were expected to have distinct nationalistic implications for the infant nation. Blue backed Speller. As a teacher, he had come to dislike American elementary schools. They could be overcrowded, with up to 70 children of all ages crammed into one-room schoolhouses. They had poor underpaid staff, no desks, and unsatisfactory textbooks that came from England. Webster thought that Americans should learn from American books, so he began writing a three-volume compendium, A Grammatical Institute of the English Language. The work consisted of a speller, a grammar, and a reader. His goal was to provide a uniquely American approach to training children. His most important improvement, he claimed, was to rescue our native tongue from the clamor of pedantry that surrounded English grammar and pronunciation. He complained that the English language had been corrupted by the British aristocracy, which set its own standard for proper spelling and pronunciation. Webster rejected the notion that the study of Greek and Latin must precede the study of English grammar. The appropriate standard for the American language, argued Webster, was the same republican principles as American civil and ecclesiastical constitutions. This meant that the people at large must control their language. Popular sovereignty in government must be accompanied by popular usage in language. The speller was arranged so that it could be easily taught to students, and it progressed by age. From his own experiences as a teacher, Webster thought the speller should be simple and gave an orderly presentation of words and the rules of speaking and pronunciation. He believed students learned most readily when he broke a complex problem into its component parts and had each pupil master one part before moving to the next. Ellis argues that Webster anticipated some of the insights currently associated with Jean Piaget's theory of cognitive development. Webster said that children pass through distinctive learning phases in which they master increasingly complex or abstract tasks. Therefore, teachers must not try to teach a three-year-old how to read, they could not do it until age five. He organized his speller accordingly, beginning with the alphabet and moving systematically through the different sounds of vowels and consonants, then syllables, then simple words, then more complex words, then sentences. The speller was originally titled the first part of the Grammatical Institute of the English Language. Over the course of 385 editions in his lifetime, the title was changed in 1786 to the American Spelling Book, and again in 1829 to the Elementary Spelling Book. Most people called it the blue-backed speller because of its blue cover, and for the next 100 years, Webster's book taught children how to read, spell, and pronounce words. It was the most popular American book of its time. By 1837 it had sold 15 million copies, and some 60 million by 1890, reaching the majority of young students in the nation's first century. Its royalty of a half cent per copy was enough to sustain Webster in his other endeavors. It also helped create the popular contest known as Spelling Bees. As time went on, Webster changed the speakings in the book to more phonetic ones. Most of them already existed as alternative spellings. He chose speakings like defense, color and traveler, and changed the re to a in words like center. He also changed tongue to the older spelling tongue, but this did not catch on. Part 3 of his grammatical institute was a reader designed to uplift the mind and diffuse the principles of virtue and patriotism. In the choice of pieces, he explained, I have not been inattentive to the political interests of America. Several of those masterly addresses of Congress, written at the commencement of the late revolution, contain such noble, just, and independent sentiments of liberty and patriotism, that I cannot help wishing to transfuse them into the breasts of the rising generation. Students received the usual quota of Plutarch, Shakespeare, Swift, and Addison, as well as such Americans as Joel Barlow's Vision of Columbus, Timothy Dwight's Conquest of Canaan, and John Trumbull's poem Mayfingal. He included excerpts from Tom Paine's The Crisis and an essay by Thomas Day calling for the abolition of slavery in accord with the Declaration of Independence. 
Webster's speller was entirely secular by design. It ended with two pages of important dates in American history, beginning with Columbus's in 1492 and ending with the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. There was no mention of God, the Bible, or sacred events. Let sacred things be appropriated for sacred purposes, wrote Webster. As Ellis explains, Webster began to construct a secular catechism to the nation, state. Here was the first appearance of civics in American school books. In this sense, Webster's speller becoming what was to be the secular successor to the New England primer with its explicitly biblical injunctions later in life. Webster became intensely religious and added religious themes. However, after 1840 Webster's books lost market share to the McGuffey eclectic readers of William Holmes McGuffey, which sold over 120 million copies. Vincent P. Beinock examines Webster in relation to his commitment to the idea of a unified American national culture that would stave off the decline of Republican virtues and solidarity. Webster acquired his perspective on language from such theorists as Maupertuis, Michaelis, and Herder. There he found the belief that a nation's linguistic forms and the thoughts correlated with them shaped individuals' behavior. Thus the etymological clarification and reform of American English promised to improve citizens' manners and thereby preserve republican purity and social stability. This presupposition animated Webster's Speller and Grammar Dictionary. Publication in 1806, Webster published his first dictionary, a compendious dictionary of the English language. In 1807 Webster began compiling an expanded and fully comprehensive dictionary, an American dictionary of the English language. It took 26 years to complete. To evaluate the etymology of words, Webster learned 28 languages, including Old English, Gothic, German, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish, French, Dutch, Welsh, Russian, Hebrew, Aramaic, Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit. Webster hoped to standardize American speech, since Americans in different parts of the country used different languages. They also spelled, pronounced, and used English words differently. Webster completed his dictionary during his year abroad in January 1825 in a boarding house in Cambridge, England. His book contained 70,000 words, of which 12,000 had never appeared in a published dictionary before. As a spelling reformer, Webster preferred speakings that matched pronunciation better. In A Companion to the American Revolution, John Algio notes, It is often assumed that characteristically American speakings were invented by Noah Webster. He was very influential in popularizing certain speakings in America, but he did not originate them. Rather, he chose already existing options such as center, color and check on such grounds as simplicity, analogy or etymology. He also added American words, like skunk and squash, that did not appear in British dictionaries. At the age of 70, Webster published his dictionary in 1828, registering the copyright on April 14. Though it now has an honored place in the history of American English, Webster's first dictionary only sold 2,500 copies. He was forced to mortgage his home to develop a second edition, and his life from then on was plagued with debt. In 1840, the second edition was published in two volumes. On May 28, 1843, a few days after he had completed revising an appendix to the second edition, and with much of his efforts with the dictionary still unrecognized, Noah Webster died. The rights to his dictionary were acquired by George and Charles Merriam in 1843 from Webster's estate and all contemporary Merriam-Webster. Dictionaries trace their lineage to that of Webster, although many others have adopted his name, attempting to share in the prestige. Impact Lepore demonstrates Webster's paradoxical ideas about language and politics and shows why Webster's endeavors were, at first, so poorly received.
culturally conservative Federalists denounced the work as radical, too inclusive in its lexicon and even bordering on vulgar. Meanwhile, Webster's old foes, the Republicans, attacked the man, labeling him mad for such an undertaking. Scholars have long seen Webster's 1844 dictionary to be an important resource for reading poet Emily Dickinson's life and work. She once commented that the lexicon was her only companion for years. One biographer said, the dictionary was no mere reference book to her, she read it as a priest his breviary, over and over, page by page. With utter absorption, Webster's dictionaries dominated the English-speaking world. In 1850, for example, Blackie and Son in Glasgow published the first general dictionary of English that relied heavily upon pictorial illustrations integrated with the text. It's the Imperial Dictionary, English, technological, and scientific, adapted to the present state of literature, science, and art. On the basis of Webster's English Dictionary used Webster's for most of their text, adding some additional technical words that went with illustrations of machinery.